so uh, today uh, based on uh, from exam point of view right? but, uh, we thought we are doing lot of lectures uh, why not we keep uh, start doing uh, because the problem is going to persist so we will start doing some exam point of view cases so how you are expected to present a case uh, in the practical exams which will help you uh, come out easily so some model uh, case presentations we will do here afterwards no during my classes i think at least uh, maybe monthly two cases or three cases we will do uh, practical based uh, cases okay and you can message me which case you want uh, i will prepare accordingly okay uh, so today i thought uh, we will take nephrotic uh, syndrome uh, case presentation so avinash will uh, present the case for me and i will do the discussion part okay a uh, 6 year old mani from chengalpet tamil nadu informant is mother and reliability is good okay so the first part will be the demographic details so here is a 6 year old boy uh, with uh, informant being mother whose reliability is good so the demographic part you should be presenting okay presenting complaints generalized swelling for the past 5 days okay so the uh, presenting complaint should be in the uh, uh, patient's own language so they have come with generalized swelling for the past 5 days this is presenting in illness the patient was apparently normal 5 days back when he developed swelling of his eyes it later progressed to involve the upper limbs abdomen and lower limbs swelling is more in the morning there is decreased frequency of maturation okay okay avinash so based on this uh, uh, what uh, system do you think it's involved uh so renal decreased frequency of maturation plus uh, the swelling indicates edema so probably proteinuria which would indicate uh, some renal cause okay okay good so the notes uh, probable explanation is uh, whenever we ask any uh, history we should be able to find out why we are asking such questions so here uh, swelling around the eyes which is nothing but periorbital puffiness then second is the swelling is more in the morning so early morning puffiness with decreased maturation this all three suggest that it is a renal in origin that's all so we will know this much only so a uh, peri orbital puffiness which is present in the early morning early morning puffiness with may or may not with associated decreased maturation suggests that it is renal in origin so this is what we are going to get from the presenting complaints okay okay so next so for uh, edema so now the child has come with edema so we have a lot of differential diagnosis for edema edema could be due to cardiac cause causing edema it could be due to hepatic cause causing edema it could be due to malabsorption and uh, hypoproteinemia malabsorption and malnutrition like uh, kwashiorkor you can get uh, edema so uh, this uh, kwashiorkor uh, it could be precipitated this malnutrition can be worsened by diseases like tuberculosis and measles so measles and tuberculosis worsens the uh, malnutrition towards kwashiorkor so the edema could be due to malnutrition and also to allergy so these are the differential diagnosis for the edema cardiac cause hepatic cause uh, malabsorption and hypoproteinemia malnutrition especially kwashiorkor and allergy so allergy can cause a uh, lot of edema and itching so now you have to ask questions related to that so let's see no history of breathlessness palpitations or cyanosis no history of joint pain or sore throat okay so no history of breathlessness palpitation cyanosis question leads to cardiac cause no history of joint pain and sore throat suggests that it's rheumatic in uh, it's not rheumatic fever the edema is uh, not due to the rheumatic etiology causing edema no history of jaundice hematemesis melina or high colored urine okay so this uh, history rules out the hepatic cause no history of greasy bulky stools no history of measles no history of prolonged fever or cough okay so these questions are uh, greasy bulky stools such as malabsorption resulting in hypoproteinemia and edema 
and this measles can precipitate the malnutrition towards the extreme uh, end that is called shelter similarly tuberculosis also can uh, precipitate the extremes of malnutrition and uh, finally is uh, no history of drug, drug injection, injection to rule out any allergy similarly no history of insect bite plus uh, any history of itchy rash so that is also suggestive of allergy so edema we had a typical renal cause of history like early morning puffiness and peri uh, early morning edema periorbital puffiness then you ask the negative history to rule out the cardiac cause to rule out the hepatic cause to rule out the malnutrition and uh, 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 malabsorption and to rule out the allergy so this is how you are supposed to take the history every uh, point which we ask has to give you some meaning to what you are up to there is no point in just randomly asking any uh, questions to the patient you need to derive something out of it why am i asking these questions okay okay so uh, other negative history now uh, you have ruled out the other causes of edema so now you need to ask questions to differentiate in the renal there are two important parts whether it is nephrotic syndrome or whether it is uh, post streptococcal nephritic syndrome so minimal change nephrotic syndrome versus post streptococcal nephritic syndrome similarly there is a uh, other cause a secondary causes of nephrotic syndrome like sle hepatitis b and malaria they are the secondary causes of nephrotic syndrome similarly there are there can be complications due to nephrotic syndrome it could be subacute bacterial peritonitis it could be cellulitis so you are supposed to ask questions to pick up whether uh to answer these questions in uh, thought okay so let's go through the further negative history no history of cola colored urine no history of skin lesions in the recent past okay so cola colored urine which suggest uh, what does this suggest avinash uh, post streptococcal nephritis it suggests hematuria yeah, no hematuria. It suggests glomerular hematuria and uh, no history of skin lesions in the recent past means uh, impetigo leading on to the streptococcal nephritic yes, syndrome yes. so these uh, negative history you are supposed to ask if it is not there then probably it's not post streptococcal nephritic syndrome so this negative history you are supposed to ask okay then uh, no history of headache or convulsions why did we ask that question avinash no history of headache and convulsions um headache and convulsions to probably hypertension okay so okay. hypertension uh, it's very common in nephritic syndromes nephrotic we don't see so much of uh, hypertension so hypertension leading on to headache and convulsions is probably nephritic syndrome okay and to uh, pick up the other causes of nephrotic syndrome the other causes mean secondary causes unless we treat the uh, these uh, causes like sle your nephrotic is not going to get all right okay so avinash no history of skin rash or joint pains okay so skin rash and joint pain suggest what sle sir. sle and other collagen vascular diseases no history of drug intake okay so drug intake drugs are also known to cause nephrotic syndrome like uh, penicillin and nsaids are known to cause uh, nephrotic syndrome no history of jaundice and blood transfusion that's for hepatitis b so hepatitis b is known to cause nephrotic syndrome no history of fever with chills for completion sake malaria can cause nephrotic syndrome okay okay so to rule out complications so now nephrotic syndrome can cause complications so what are the questions you will ask for complications uh, no history of abdominal pain and fever so that suggests peritonitis sir. peritonitis so subacute bacterial peritonitis is a common complication of nephrotic syndrome so that should be in your negative history no history of abdominal pain and fever no history of fever with red with skin redness or pain okay so that's such a cellulitis okay Cellular. so superficial redness and pain is cellulitis and abdominal pain and fever will be so, so subacute bacterial peritonitis okay and uh, not only this uh, nephrotic can also result in uh, infections like uh, varicella and pneumonia they are in an immunosuppressed state especially uh, pneumococcus and uh, staphylococcal infections are common okay okay so move on to the next slide past history okay there has been history of similar episodes in the past first one occurred at 3 years of age took medications for 2 months initially daily and then on alternate days 
okay so this uh, history of uh, recurrent uh, episodes okay we will move on further four more episodes occurred each time responding to medications only to relapse later no history of tb asthma or jaundice in the past okay okay so so the nephrotic syndrome compared to nephritic syndrome nephrotic syndrome is characterized by repeated relapses so in your past history you should be asking uh, the uh, history of similar episodes in the past okay so here uh, there is history of similar episodes in the past and they have even taken medications uh, so they have taken medications for a quite a long duration and when you ask in detail it might they typically they will say initially we started daily and then we took alternate day so probably what drugs they are taking uh, vinash probably probably uh, steroids probably, probably steroids okay the steroid course is like that you give it for a period of time uh, initially it will be daily dose and then later on it will be in the alternate uh, day steroid so nephrotic syndrome is characterized by repeated relapses so when you have keep getting again and again it's probably not a post streptococcal glomerulonephritis post streptococcal glomerulonephritis usually occurs once it's not like the rheumatic fever uh, which keeps on occurring again and again post streptococcal glomerulonephritis usually occurs only once and that's why we don't give penicillin prophylaxis in psgn okay okay so psgn doesn't uh, recur and hence no penicillin prophylaxis okay and uh, so the, here the daily medication and alternate medication suggests that the patient is on steroids and for completion sake uh, any past history should have no history of tb asthma jaundice and any operation in the past okay okay then uh, other histories are uh, taken as usual i am not going uh, into detail i am concentrating on nephrotic so you have to take birth history you have to take uh, birth history will include uh, uh, the antenatal significant antenatal perinatal history whether any injury was there any but i think birth history is more relevant when you have a case of uh, cerebral palsy where you need to know why it happened okay immunization history is important we need to know whether it is uh, taken uh, the regular uh, schedule national immunization schedule or the iap schedule why is this immunization is important avinash any idea uh, because uh, uh, the we said already that they are prone for pneumococcal infection okay why uh, for nephrotic syndrome why immunization is is important they might ask you they are prone for pneumococcal infection so make sure that the child has received a pneumococcal vaccine okay so pneumococcal vaccine uh, history is given and if not given at least plan now to plan to give pneumococcal vaccination developmental history i don't think not a big issue big issue uh, you have to take the routine uh, history dietary history uh, take the routine uh, dietary history and uh, in the advice uh, we have to go in the dietary advice we have to advise about the protein intake because there is lot of protein urea is happening so you need to assess how much protein the child is taking so that at the end you have to advise uh, that proteins has to be taken more because of the protein urea with high biological value and uh, salt has to be restricted okay usually any edema we restrict uh, salt and the socio economic history is uh, as usual you take the regular socio economic history mainly the education status is important because it's a chronic disease so we need to understand how far they understand the disease how far they are going to continue the treatment so follow up and all monitoring uh, education is very important okay sir excuse me sir uh wait pa wait ah uh, tell pa tell sir is hepi vaccination useful to know h influenza h influenza hepi sir Hep hepatitis b because uh, it can also be vaccine uh, as a routine we give for everyone but uh, with uh, regards to nephrotic i think uh, once it comes it's not going to help but it's going to protect one form of nephrotic syndrome with regards to nephrotic if you are saying hepatitis b is a cause of secondary cause of nephrotic but what's your doubt actually no no sir like should it, is it will it prevent it in any way or will it occur irrespective of the vaccination nephrotic it will, no, no, it will prevent nephrotic yes sir, will it prevent the occurrence of Hepi, hepi, clad which causes nephrotic. Ha, huh, the if you are giving vaccination, it's not going to come, Allah. So you will not get hepatitis B. So nephrotic will not occur. That one form of nephrotic. Okay. okay. 
but the regular minimal change has nothing to do with hepatitis b status so the most common type of nephrotic is uh, minimal change nephrotic that has nothing to do with uh, hepatitis b status it's going it's idiopathic it has no reason why it comes it comes just like that okay okay thank you okay okay so let's move on uh, so next uh, wait a minute okay so summary of the history six year old child presenting with generalized edema since five days several episodes in the past and has taken medications for the same so uh, almost do you want anything to add i think it's fine i think no yes sir so th that's the summary actually so six year old child presenting with generalized edema since five days he had several episodes in the past and has been taking medications for the same and what is your analysis of the summary probably the edema it's a renal in origin probably the condition which you are dealing is nephrotic syndrome and uh, it's sensitive to steroid and hence uh, the condition which you are discussing is minimal change nephrotic syndrome is possible so hence here minimal change nephrotic syndrome is possible probably it's nephrotic syndrome and sensitive to steroids so this is what we have learned from the history so almost uh, uh, everything we have picked up uh, the management and everything from the history itself examination findings are going to be very less in uh, renal uh, problems which we will go through now so examination vitals the child is conscious and oriented pulse rate is 76 beats per minute respiratory rate is 26 per minute temperature of 37.5 degrees celsius blood pressure is 90 by 74 mm mercury measured in the right upper limb which is normal for his age okay so in the vitals uh, it's uh, important for every child to measure the vitals that is the order but with regards to nephrotic syndrome i am more concerned about the uh, which one avinash i am more concerned about the blood pressure sir. blood pressure i am concerned about the blood pressure because minimal change nephrotic syndrome you don't expect very high blood pressure if blood pressure is high probably i am uh, dealing with nephritis okay so and uh, use the appropriate size cuff to measure the blood pressure that's the one problem which you will have children's different age so you have to use the appropriate size cuff and uh, blood pressure is elevated in nephritis usually it is normal in nephrotic syndrome so coming to the next part after the vitals you are going to write down the anthropometry weight 22 so weight is uh, 22 kg uh, voice is breaking avinash so weight is 22 kg which falls in the 75th percentile of uh, iap growth chart height is 115 cm <clears throat> which falls in the 50th percentile of iap growth chart okay so weight and height looks okay so this is how you should present you should uh, there is no point in uh, just measuring the weight and telling you have to give your interpretation that's very important sir so don't say the anthropometry weight is 22 kg height is 150 cm that might irritate the examiner the examiner wants what's your interpretation so so you are a doctor so they expect you to interpret rather than the doing the tailor uh, thing you are not expected to be a tailor to do just the measurements you have to give your interpretation so what is the height which falls in the 50th percentile of the iap growth chart similarly head circumference 51 cm and is uh, normal and yeah. abdominal girth is uh, 55 cm but thing is abdominal girth uh, more of uh, to monitor in order to monitor there is no hard and fast this is the normal abdominal girth it's just meant to monitor to see whether the girth is increasing which means the edema is increasing or decreasing which means the edema is coming down okay so uh, and one more thing the weight may not be the true weight which we are seeing because of the edema what we are seeing might be because of the fluid retention okay and it is a very good uh, parameter to monitor the progress just like abdominal girth weight is a very good uh, tool to monitor the progress whether the child is uh, improving or worsening how will you know you measure the weight okay so clinical feature to say whether the child is improving or not it is weight 
increased weight means fluid retention and edema okay and uh, height one more important thing is height may be stunted why it might be stunted because of the steroids steroids has this uh, side effect of stunting the growth so if the child is uh, on lot of steroids the height might be affected okay. so general physical examination head to toe examination generalized edema present over the face abdomen back and legs no scrotal edema no pallor clubbing or cyanosis so uh, no no cushing oid uh, features okay so uh, we are worried in the head to foot examination where is the edema so you have to tell how is the edema from the face abdomen back legs and especially do not forget to look into the scrotum so scrotal edema will also be there if the edema is more and look for regular paler clubbing cyanosis and a very important say that there are no cushing oid features like uh, uh, face will be like moon faces there might be striae in the abdomen so this are all suggestive of uh, cushing oid uh, features because of the steroid so the edema uh, see whether it is uh, pitting or non pitting and if the face is a bit round with non pitting type of edema so probably you are dealing with the cushing oid features rather than edema due to the steroid toxicity okay so in head to foot examination do not miss the edema and if it is peri orbital edema it is uh, confirms that it is probably renal in cause because the cardiac edema will be dependent in the legs so peri orbital edema suggests more of renal cause and uh, do not forget to miss the you know, 10th quadrant that is the perineum so scrotal edema suggests that the edema is a bit more okay so this is how uh, usually an unresolved uh, nephrotic syndrome presence on looking itself you can say in the exam that okay they have given probably a case of nephrotic syndrome on looking at the peri orbital edema itself. okay so systemic examination of the abdomen avinash are you there okay so uh, yes uh, sorry the internet I think it's not coming. So your voice is not clear. Vasini, you are on. I think. Can you read it for me? Or anybody wants to read? So is it okay now? Ha! Huh, I think uh, intermittently you are better. Okay. Okay. Uh, inspection. The abdomen is distended. all quadrants are moving with respiration umbilicus is stretched transversely wait a minute one minute no scars sinuses or dilated veins scrotum is edematous on palpation no area of tenderness or guarding fluid thrill is absent liver spleen and kidney are not palpable on percussion shifting dullness is present on auscultation normal bowel sounds were heard okay so so based on uh, this uh, you have to go systemically you know that it's going to be the renal uh, uh, examination so abdomen you have to be meticulous and you have to be Uh, concerned about the fluid accumulation so in inspection we are going to talk about the flanks i think i didn't mention flanks are free or full on inspection you have to say that the flanks are free or full how is the umbilicus usually in ascites you will have a um, stretched umbilicus smiling umbilicus transversely stretched umbilicus and uh, sometimes umbilical hernia can be there in children so flanks full and the stretched umbilicus transversely smiling umbilicus can be there and uh, in palpation you are going to look for a fluid thrill whether it is present or not so if fluid thrill is present it's going to be a uh, significant massive ascites okay and in percussion you are going to see whether uh, shifting dullness is present or not and uh, then uh, also look for whether you are able to do the uh, kidney is palpable or not and if fluid is there what type of palpation they will ask uh, you have to go for the dipping palpation mode okay so dipping palpation you have to 
do it okay so uh, one minute here so abdominal examination is all about demonstration of the fluid collection and also look for any peritonitis so no area of tenderness we have talked about no area of tenderness or redness okay and uh, if there is any edema and you say that there is no shifting dullness there is no fluid thrill then uh, you have to be very careful to say that everything is negative okay then they will ask you how else if there is minimal fluid what will you do you have to say i will look for the puddle sign puddle sign is nothing but an auscultator a uh, percussion technique where the child is kept in the knee elbow position so you have to keep the child in the knee elbow position and both percussion and uh, auscultation is done so it's an auscultator percussion technique and it is done in the knee elbow position so puddle sign for minimal ascites okay and the scrotum remember you should always examine in the inspection part okay so summary of the findings 6 year old boy presents with generalized edema history of similar episodes in the past which responded to probable treatment on steroids on examination there is generalized edema including moderate ascites okay so i i forgot to tell that uh, not only abdomen examination you have to also do other system examination especially the respiratory system what will you look for uh, avinash in respiratory system um so uh, Okay. We can get the same fluid actually, same fluid. fluid so yeah. effusion can be there. So pleural effusion. It's a generalized edema, no? So generalized fluid collection. So pleural effusion can be there. So dullness in the auscultation sounds might be dull, and uh, dull on percussion, decreased breath sounds will be there. So these findings you have to see whether it's there or not. So final diagnosis based on your history and examination is most probably I'm dealing with nephrotic syndrome. probably it's a minimal change variant and it is steroid responsive without hypertension and without any complications like peritonitis so this is how you are supposed to present plus if you add it would be nice how is the nutrition status and how is the development with the normal development with normal immunization status and uh, with uh, that so so pm malnutrition state with grade one malnutrition iap classification something like that you have to end so so this is you tell the probable diagnosis what type it is whether there are any complications involved in it okay without hypertension and without peritonitis and tell the nutrition status with a grade 1 or grade 2 malnutrition and uh, tell the immunization status and the developmental status it would be nice okay sorry okay so final two slides uh, Uh, you can add uh, avinash so what's your investigation plan so it's an nephrotic syndrome what's your investigation plan i would like to do a cbc and esr do urine cult urine routine for albumin and rbcs urine spot sample for urinary protein to creatinine ratio serum albumin lipid profile blood urea and serum creatinine and electrolytes complement c3 okay so so if they ask after the diagnosis so once you are done with the diagnosis then if you have done well you are passed after this it's just to add your marks in the investigation plan how far you know this case so if you are going going through the investigation part then i think you are good okay so i would like to do cbc esr that's uh, meant to look for any infection so cbc counts might be elevated esr may be elevated but why we are doing the urine routine for albumin to look for the proteinuria because nephrotic syndrome is characterized by massive proteinuria and why we look for rbcs for hematuria if there is a significant hematuria probably we are dealing with nephritis rather than nephrotic syndrome and urine spot sample uh, urine protein to creatinine ratio so this ratio usually it will be 0.2 and 0.2 to 2 is your nephritic range of proteinuria and anything about 2 is considered the nephrotic range of proteinuria so this is a very important question this itself you say you are uh, through so how will you define the proteinuria the protein spot protein creatinine ratio if it is more than 2 it is in the nephrotic range of proteinuria so this is related to the urine so urine for albumin somewhere around 3 plus 4 plus okay and uh, protein creatinine ratio about 2 
uh, and there should be not much RBCs. Okay. And with regards to the blood, because of the proteinuria, you will have hypoalbuminemia. So albumin will be less than your 3.5 uh, uh, milligram per deciliter. So uh, albumin, I think it's in gram. So 3.5 grams per deciliter. So it will be less than that in uh, nephrotic because of the proteinuria. Usually it might be in 2.5, it will be less. Okay. And there will be hyperlipidemia. So that's why we do the lipid profile. And the blood urea and serum creatinine, Usually in nephritis, the RFT will be elevated. Nephrotic syndrome, we don't get uh, elevation in renal parameters unless there is a severe intravascular uh, volume depletion due to hyperproteinemia. So that's in the end stage when you don't give adequate fluids, when you give a lot of diuretics in nephrotic syndrome, you can have intravascular fluid loss resulting in elevated RFT. So usually RFTs are elevated in nephritis, not nephrotic. Okay. And the complement 3 also will be decreased in nephritis. It's not a feature of nephrotic syndrome, complement 3 levels. So what are the basic investigations? I look for the urine investigations for nephrotic to uh, point out the proteinuria. I look for the renal investigations, RFT and hypoalbuminemia and hyperlipidemia. Okay, C3 can be added uh, later on to differentiate between nephrotic and nephritis. Okay. And what are the additional tests will you do? So we do the manto and chest X-ray. Why do we have to do manto and chest X-ray, Avinash? Sir, for tuberculosis. So why you should uh, rule out tuberculosis? Because uh, uh, we are going to start steroids. Okay, steroids can worsen the tuberculosis if he has some latent tuberculosis within himself. So if you are uh, Finding out tuberculosis by your investigation, you have to start simultaneously anti-tubercular drugs along with steroids. Okay, and uh, uh, if you are suspecting glomerular nephritis, I said I'll be C3 levels, which will be low in glomerular nephritis, and also ASO titers or throat swab, throat swab for streptococcal uh, infection. So we have to do this uh, extra test if you want to rule out glomerular nephritis. Okay, and ANA and rheumatoid factor to rule out uh, collagen vascular diseases like SLE. And as said already, HBSAG to rule out uh, hepatitis B. And uh, okay, so that's your additional test. So what treatment you want to give, Avinash? So I think this is your last uh, part. Prednisolone, two milligram per kg per day for six weeks, followed by 1.5 milligram per kg on alternate days for another six weeks. Okay. So this is the current uh, recommendation we are going to give. So if you tell this, what is the treatment you are through? So I'm just saying the important part rather than going into deep. If you just remember and say, this is the treatment you are through. So prednisolone 2 mg per kg per day for six weeks, followed by 1.5 mg per kg on alternate days for another six weeks. So this is the treatment. And what else you will do? Uh, you are going to monitor Avinash. The daily urinary proteins the remission and the blood pressure so you are going to monitor daily blood pressure daily weight monitoring and urinary dipstick you are going to look for whether it is three plus or four plus and our uh, goal is to reach trace or nil so the proteins in the urine should be trace or nil for treatment to be successful okay so for remission to occur the protein in the dipstick should be trace or nil but usually in nephrotic it will be in the range of three plus or four plus. So we are going to look daily the dipstick and the blood pressure and weight monitoring. Okay. Diuretics can be used if edema is significant. Tyrosamide okay. and spironolactone. spironolactone. Okay. So we don't, uh, we, significant edema is there. We know that edema is there, but uh, we don't give diuretics straight away because this edema is because of hypoalbuminemia and uh, the fluid is in the extracellular compartment. So whatever diuretics we use, the intravascular uh, fluid only is going to go out, which will result in, in fact, a lot of uh, problems. It can elevate your RFT because of poor perfusion. It can result in shock. So the diuretics has to be the last resort. First resort is steroids. Steroids will definitely cause diuresis. If the child is responding to steroid, it will cause diuresis and it will cause decrease in the edema. If it doesn't respond and if the edema is massive, then go for uh, next step of diuretics. So we can use uh, cautiously the frusamide followed by spironolactone, but have a look on the vitals. The child should not slip into shock.
and uh, as said already the salt restriction we have to do and uh, there is lot of proteinuria going on so you have to give protein of high biological value which is example high biological value avinash proteins of sorry so what protein of high biological value so egg egg is a good so example high biological, uh, high biological value okay so good protein you keep giving but so remember 80 to 90 percentage of the children are going to respond to steroid therapy and uh, steroids have the side effect of increasing the blood pressure okay so we have to monitor for blood pressure okay and uh, if there is massive edema uh, your uh, diuretics are not helping massive edema you can't even breathe because of the edema pleural effusion everything then you can try human albumin infusion so the main cause of the edema is hypoalbuminemia so give human albumin infusion if there is massive edema as the last resort okay uh from this avinash i will take on so uh, thanks avinash welcome uh so i'll just say another few important questions they might ask you at the end of the viva so what treatment for relapse so far we talked about the initial treatment treatment for relapse will be the same prednisolone 2 mg per kg per day but it's not for 6 weeks it's going to be till the Uh, consecutive three urine samples are negative for protein so that's how it's going to be 2 mg per kg per day for till three urine samples are negative for uh, dipstick protein okay then followed by prednisolone 1.5 mg per kg every alternate day this is given for the uh, four weeks okay this so this is the treatment for relapse okay so e even if you say the standard treatment you are okay but if you want more marks if the examiner wants to probe you he might start these questions so it's better to learn these questions and what is the definition for frequent relapser what is steroid dependence what is steroid resistant okay uh, frequently relapsing nephrotic syndrome when there are four or more relapses in a year it's called frequently relapsing so f for four so remember four or more relapses in a year is frequently relapsing nephrotic syndrome steroid dependence what is steroid dependence uh, whenever you start tapering from the 2 mg per kg if you are tapering to 1.5 mg per kg alternate day or within 2 weeks of stopping the steroids he gets a relapse then it means that the child is dependent on steroids he is almost like a uh, drug addict some kind no he becomes dependent on steroids so you give the steroids even if you taper or even if you stop within 2 weeks he gets the relapse then it is steroid dependent and steroid resistant is no response even after 4 weeks of steroid therapy so even after giving daily the 2 mg per kg the child is not responding then uh, it's a steroid resistant but you come to know by 2 weeks itself by 2 weeks you are not having response so probably it is steroid resistant steroid resistant probably it is not minimal change okay so what are the treatment options with frequent relapses so uh, the child is getting again and again so one option is do not do not stop straight away steroids reduce the dose of steroids keep maintaining them in a smaller dose for a longer period so long term alternate day prednisolone instead of the 6 weeks you give it for quite a long time and you can even keep it on a lower dose instead of 1.5 mg per kg you can keep it like 0.5 to 0.7 mg per kg every alternate day so long term alternate day prednisolone can be tried because the child is frequently relapsing or if there is steroid toxicity or steroid not responding to spare from steroid toxicity if there is pushing out features you go for steroid sparing drugs so that is the second line drugs like they might ask you what are the steroid sparing drugs or what are the second line drugs for nephrotic so it is levomisole cyclophosphamide cyclosporine and mycophenolate mofetil okay so this uh, this is uh, this should have come in the first uh, what is nephrotic syndrome so it is characterized by so remember massive proteinuria so what is the definition for massive proteinuria i said already urine dipstick should have more than 3 plus or 4 plus urine spot protein creatinine ratio should be more than 2 or uh, it should be more than 40 mg per meter square per hour or 1 g per meter square per day 
So any any definition you can use. What is the definition for massive proteinuria? Simpler will be urine dipstick of plus three or plus four. Protein creatinine ratio spot protein creatinine ratio more than two. If they want per hour, it should be more than forty milligram per meter square per hour, or per day it's going to be one gram per meter square per day. Okay. So followed by if you have so much proteinuria, you are going to have hypoalbuminemia, which is less than two point five grams percentage in edema. And hyperlipidemia. So the serum cholesterol is going to be more than 200 milligram per cent. So this is the definition. If you want, what is nephrotic syndrome? This question definitely they will ask you. So massive proteinuria. What defines massive proteinuria? You should know. Followed by hypoalbuminemia and edema, and often associated with hyperlipidemia, where the serum cholesterol is more than 200 milligram per cent. Okay. So what are the varieties of nephrotic syndrome? So congenital nephrotic syndrome, which is less than one year, if the child is less than one year, it is congenital. It's not going to respond to steroids. It's probably some genetic defects. This is the commonest. If they ask you what is the commonest, it is the primary or idiopathic nephrotic syndrome. There is no cause for it, and it is 85 percentage of all the nephrotic syndrome, of which the most common is minimal change nephrotic syndrome. If they ask of any other type, you can say focal segmental sclerosis. It's it's only five to ten percentage focal segmental sclerosis. So which is the commonest? It's going to be minimal change nephrotic syndrome more than seventy five percent, and you have secondary nephrotic syndrome due to lot of causes like collagen vascular disease, infections like hepatitis B, malaria, drugs like NSAIDs and penicillin. This all we discussed. So what are the varieties of nephrotic syndrome? Congenital, primary or idiopathic. Secondary nephrotic syndrome. Okay, so what are the complications of nephrotic syndrome? They may ask you, what are the complications? We already said it can result in thromboembolic complications like uh, renal thrombosis, cerebral vein thrombosis, pulmonary vein thrombosis. Thromboembolic complications. They are prone for infections. We said already we are going to ask for uh, subacute bacterial peritonitis, cellulitis. They are prone for TB because you are going to start steroids. They are prone for chickenpox. And pneumonia. This is where the vaccination is important. Make sure these children are vaccinated for pneumonia, chickenpox, and um, okay, chickenpox and pneumonia. And uh, other complication is steroid toxicity. Because of the steroid, they are prone for Cushingoid features, hypertension, and osteoporosis. So, if they ask what are the complications of nephrotic syndrome, you should be able to say this. And uh, last uh, few slides, two slides. How will you differentiate which is minimal change nephrotic and which is uh, post-infectious nephritis? So one is age. Nephrotic occurs in the less than five-year group, whereas the post-epidemical nephritis in the school-going children or the older children. And who are more common? Boys are more common in nephrotic, whereas in nephritic it is the equal sex. And uh, minimal change nephrotic syndrome, uh, uh, there is uh, hypertension is going to be rare. Hematuria is going to be rare. But nephritis. Very common is going to be the cola colored urine. Hypertension is going to be there, and uh, RFTs are going to be deranged. So that is the difference. Okay, and C3 levels are going to be normal in nephrotic, and C3 levels are going to be low in nephritis. And response to steroids, nephrotic responds well to steroids, whereas other forms of nephritis are not going to respond. Proteinuria is going to be persist. So this is a very important differentiation. They will ask you. Why you are saying this is nephrotic? So you should say so the child's age factor. Child has less than school age. The child had the symptoms. Child is a boy. Child doesn't have hematuria. Child doesn't have hypertension. Child had responded to steroids. So probably I am dealing with minimal change nephrotic syndrome. This is how you have to say. And what are the indications? I think this is the final slide. When will you go for renal biopsy? I am not going to go for renal biopsy for all cases of nephrotic. But if I feel that it is not minimal change, then I will go for renal biopsy because I need to know what is the cause for this uh, kidney derangement. Okay, so age less than 12 months, probably I am dealing with congenital nephrotic, so I will go for a biopsy. The child is not responding to steroids, probably it's not minimal change nephrotic, so I am going for renal biopsy. The child is having persistent hypertension, hematuria, low C3 levels, which all points towards Glomerular nephritis. Then I will go for renal biopsy, or the renal function is elevated. Urea creatinine is elevated, which is not common in nephrotic syndrome. So these are the conditions which where I will go for renal 
biopsy okay uh, okay so any doubts you have you can raise 